most autonomous and semi-autonomous driver assistance systems are built into the vehicle, or specifically built for one specific vehicle, and most use a complicated system where the manufacturer has taught its system about lane lines, and what a stop sign looks like, and what a traffic light means. They've given it a list of rules of the road, and of objects it might encounter, and in several cases they've mapped roads and the immediate surroundings down to a super high resolution. Unlike pretty much every other autonomous and semi-autonomous driver assistance system out there, Comer AI are doing things a little bit differently. And I'm not just talking about the fact that you can simply buy a development unit directly from them. Comer.ai's system isn't tied to a specific vehicle, nor is it permanently installed by a manufacturer. It's a unit you can buy off the shelf and add to hundreds of vehicles. It's taught to drive by watching humans driving, and it can do so without any maps. Thanks to an incredibly kind viewer, we have been testing a Comma 2 unit. But unfortunately this year, Comma decided to discontinue support of that unit, leaving it stuck at the last version of their software released for it. And then, a couple of weeks ago, the fan on our Comma 2 started making some noises. It's not too bad at the moment, but eventually it will need a fan replacement, and the Comma 2 was a notoriously finicky beast. It's Something where taking it apart and putting it back together should work fine, but it does have a tendency to randomly break anyway, and being based on a mobile phone that's being pushed pretty hard, the idea of spending that money and turning it into an object that I could sell to help fund its replacement into a paperweight was not hugely appealing, so instead I bowed to fate and bought a comma 3 while it was still working. While I chose the base model, comma 3, I also chose to upgrade the SSD. The base model ships with a 32GB SSD, and the top model 1TB. Comma charge nearly $500 for a 1TB SSD, and it's a pass that's available off the shelf for $100. They need to make their money, I know, but times are tight, and I decided that I would buy the unit and install the upgraded drive myself. So, what's involved in upgrading from a 2 to a 3? How did that software install go, and what about upgrading that SSD? Did I brick my new device? Let's find out! So before we start looking at the Comma 3, let's take a quick look at this Comma 2, which has carried me over six and a half thousand miles, during which time it's handled lane changes, and it's kept the car centred in the lane, it's braked for corners, and it has really worked incredibly well. Based on a OnePlus 3 phone, with the back somewhat removed and a massive heat sink and fan because it's being pushed really quite hard, it uses the rear-facing camera here on the phone as the main camera to watch the road. And then on the front here it has two cameras. These are used to point at the driver and assess the driver's attentiveness, make sure you're looking at the road. It also has a couple of LEDs down here which illuminate you with non-visible spectrum light to make sure that it can see you when it is dark, but it's not blinding you. It's small, it's pretty cheaply made, the case is 3D printed, and yet this is by far and away the best ADAS system I have encountered. I have driven Blue Cruise, I haven't driven Blue Cruise a long way recently, so we're going to be trying that out on our way to fully charge live, along with our Comma 3. I also haven't driven Tesla's full self-driving, but I have used Autopilot fairly extensively, and any of them, I would take this. But, as I said, its reliability isn't great. The phone, as I say, is being pushed very hard, and it runs pretty warm. These phones also struggle because the camera in here has to keep maintaining focus. It is a standard camera after all, and it's trying to track when it's being shaken gently by the car. So, let's compare that to the Comma 3. Okay, so what's in the box? Well, when you open it you're met with this rather nice card with a QR code on it that takes you to an install video. It also lists what else should be in the box. There's obviously the Comma 3, which we'll come to in a second, but there's also this box containing the cables that you'll need to connect it. You should also have a car-specific harness if you're not upgrading from a Comma 2, but mine is already in the car. Then there's also the sticky, which attaches the Comma unit to your windscreen.
The Comma unit is now a custom casing, not 3D printed, and features a fish eye camera on the back of the unit, along with a very nice sharp screen. That fish eye monitors for driver alertness, something that the Comma uses machine learning to detect. On the other side, you get wide and narrow angle fixed focus cameras. This improves image stability and quality over the Comma 2 and provides a much wider field of view than the old Comma 2 had. This should help with cut-in detection for vehicles merging or leaving, and also with corners, which the Comma 2 had a tendency to cut rather tight. We're going to skip over installation because it's essentially the same as the Comma 2, which we made a video on a while back, and frankly, if you want an install video, there's a ton of them on YouTube, and they are done specifically for each car. But what you do also get to see right now is what's involved in upgrading the Comma 3's SSD. Essentially, you pop the back cover off, slot in a new SSD, and screw it into place. That's easier if you're upgrading from a comma 250 gig unit, because the 32 gig unit, which is what mine was, doesn't come with the M2 screws required to install the SSD. So if you are planning to upgrade from a 32 to a larger SSD, make sure you pick up those M2 screws at the same time and make sure that they're the right length. You pop the case back together, and in some cases you might need to format that drive, but for me it just worked straight away once it was plugged in. And yes, it worked. I didn't kill it. Okay, so here we are, three weeks. 2,700 miles and one bout of COVID later. So while that trip spools out over there, Let's get to the tofu of the matter. Why would I want to install it and how did it do? Well, the why is simple. You really don't realize just how much mental effort goes into those tiny little corrections to keep the car centered in the lane, to plan out road positioning, tweak your speed here and there. Level two driver assistance systems can take a lot of that work out of your life, which when you're gonna drive 2,700 miles over four days is, well, kind of nice. We drove to San Diego and back, and I maybe spent an hour of that in total actually steering and driving. Normally on a drive like that, I'd want to trade out with another driver, but actually on this trip, I did it all both ways because I never felt particularly like I'd exerted myself. I never felt that kind of mental fatigue. You do absolutely need to stay very aware because occasionally, it will try and kill you. You will absolutely need to treat this like a learner driver who will make some staggeringly stupid mistakes. But for the most part, I didn't have to intervene at all. Now we should talk about the fact that this is fundamentally a development kit that you can buy as a non-developer. You can use it as a very expensive driver's camera out of the box, or you can install a variety of software on it that adds massively enhanced driver assistance functionality. There's Vanilla Open Pilot, which is Comma's own self-driving software, or there's a wide variety of forks. Some of these are there to tweak specific behaviours, some are tuned better for specific cars, or to add a bunch of extra features. For this drive, I chose to use Sunny Pilot version 0.8.14, if you're interested, which has some, but not all of the features of the current releases of Open Pilot. Why choose Sunny Pilot? Well, it uses OpenStreetMap data to add speed limit adjustment in, and it will also use that and vision data to do speed planning for curves, neither of which is available in stock Open Pilot at the moment. Honestly, in the Nero EV, it's rather conservative on corners, but I'm also aware that I'm quite a quick driver, apparently, and so others might not find it quite as conservative in corners as I do. It definitely had some issues. In some places, the OpenStreetMap data is 
definitely wrong and the speed limits it uses are incorrect and sometimes it would think I was on a slip road and adjust for that. Obviously you can join OpenStreetMap and correct that data but it's harder to do when you're driving thousands of miles. On the other hand you can turn off the limits and revert to your cruise control speed with just a single tap on the commas screen which is a nice touch and of course you can press the throttle which works for a while but if you keep doing that too long you get a control mismatch warning which is loud, red and unnerving and you then have to disengage and re-engage your cruise control. The reason I know that is that I tried on the way down to let the car drive through Grants Pass. It's a twisty as hell stretch of freeway and it did do it. Kinda. But it would sometimes want to slow to 30 miles an hour which is an unacceptable speed on a freeway. Its road positioning was also a little hinky at times. Other places it struggled were long straight roads with grooved concrete. It would persistently overcorrect slightly and then we'd get some ping-ponging between the two sides of the lane. It did seem limited to grooved concrete surfaces though on long straight tarmac it did just fine. And for the vast majority of the journey it kept to the speed limits, it kept us a safe distance from the car in front, it kept us in lane, performed lane changes for us, slowed appropriately for corners, slowed to some extent for merging traffic and it did all the driving that I would normally have had to do. Oh, and I should also say, and this might just be for Sunny Pilot 0.8.14, if you accidentally hit resume instead of set when you have no speed set on a Nero EV, there's a lot of warnings about a control mismatch and some rather unpleasant alert noises, and again, you have to cancel cruise control. Something that definitely reminds you that this is a development project and which is less than soothing. So is a comma 3 worth it as an upgrade from a comma 2? I'm not sure just yet. I think it will be, particularly when Navigate on OpenPilot is available. The new steering algorithms used in the latest versions of OpenPilot are definitely smoother. But when I tried them just before we left, I found it wasn't always making turns that it had reliably made with the old algorithms on the comma 2. So they need just a little bit refinement before I'd be happy with them as my daily driver. But if you're wanting a level 2 semi-autonomous system that provides the ability to drive on any road, anywhere, and I do mean anywhere, it will drive off-road uh, for you if you are reckless and an impetuous thrill seeker who wants to die. Or more realistically, if you want a system that really lightens the load for long tedious drives, you could do much worse than a comma 3. It still is, hands down, the best level 2 autonomous system that I have used. That's it for today. Thanks for joining me and see you next time. If you liked the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends. And if you really liked it, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you send goes towards helping us make great content. If you haven't already, make sure you've subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolved Take Two. And you know what? You should give the bell a gentle ring to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. And also, be sure to check out our regular sponsors, including the lovely folks at Unspun and at Energy Sage. Links are down in the description. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to everyone who makes TE possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of you who just watch and share our videos. If you're a supporter at the charged up level, you'll see your name right here on my right. And if you just joined, we're sorry if your name isn't showing up just yet. We render the list out every week or so, but sometimes our videos are produced a week or two in advance. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters Mike Weeder, Patrick Boyarski, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Brophy Wolf, Chris and Michael Johnson, Tezzer in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Regine Fellows, Denny Hyde, Chris Center and Jim Burness. And of course, out of this world, thanks to our Starman supporters, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, JP Fagerback, Joe Bresney, John Lyons, Rory Litwin, Kevin Burrowbridge, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, 
Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Will Grayland, and of course Ian. If you want to be part of that amazing list, you can join Patreon at the link below. You can hit the join button below to support us on YouTube or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links are all down there. And if you're unable to support us financially, just know that watching the video and sharing it makes a real difference to our ad revenue. And of course, it keeps the algorithm hungry and I'm safe out here far from it. Is that it? I think it's in the woods. I think it's in the woods. I should probably leave. So um, thanks for joining me. And as always, keep evolving. <laughs>